Welcome to our circuit service today as we enter into ordinary time. I'm Marianne, one of the ministers here in the Southport circuit, and it's lovely to be worshipping with you today. All the circuit churches are now open for face-to-face worship, but our online service will continue into the end of August when we will review it. It would be lovely to hear what you think. Please feel free to contact us through the circuit website. Today we will be thinking about what it means to be part of the crazy family of Jesus. But first, let us be still as we are aware of God's presence with us always. Let us pray. God of all, as one family, we worship you. We are mothers and fathers, we are sisters and brothers, and we worship you. We are sons and daughters, aunts and uncles, grannies, granddads, and we worship you. We are cousins and neighbours, friends and colleagues, and we worship you. As your family, as your church, as your community, we worship you. Amen. Hetty and Tabs now lead us in singing our first hymn, Good, Good Father. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the day
prayer of adoration. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, thank you for helping us to know the Father, to glimpse his face, to hear his voice, to see his glory. Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, thank you for making God real, present among us, sharing our humanity and opening the way to your kingdom. Lord Jesus Christ, bringer of life, thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit constantly at work in our lives, in your church and in the world. Living Lord, we offer you our thanks, we give you our praise and we pledge our service. Amen. A prayer of confession. Loving God, we like to think we are productive in your service, that our discipleship is truly fruitful. But if we are really honest, we know that it is not always the case. Some things in our lives being dead wood. We promise plenty but do not fully deliver, sometimes through neglect, rejecting your will or through failing to make enough time for you so that you can nourish and nurture our faith. We forget that real growth comes not just through our own efforts, however sincere, but by your grace. Forgive our lack of commitment sometimes and help us to be truly one with you so that we may grow in faith and bear lasting fruit of your spirit. Amen. Reading from Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Jesus accused by his family and by teachers of the law. Then Jesus entered the house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to him in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. This end has got to come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he is an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. Thank you, Brian and Christine. I'm no, I'm not the only one who suffers from imposter syndrome. That dread that someday someone will find out that I am not who I say I am. That I'm not who I want them to think that I am. 
In fact, I'm not even the person that I would want to be. I so often feel a fraud. Who am I? Stood here wearing a dog collar. Who am I when I stand to celebrate the Lord's Supper? Who am I to bury your loved one or to baptise your children? It's crazy. Next year, I will be celebrating 25 years in the Methodist Church as a minister. And I still think that someone will find out that they've made some huge mistake. That someone will stand up in a service and say, she's an imposter. Who does she think she is? She must be mad thinking that she can be a Methodist minister. And here in our lectionary reading today, we have Jesus being denounced by his family as an imposter. Who does he think he is? He has become a social embarrassment, a source of shame for the family, and he needs to be stopped, and they are going to make sure that he is. You see, they had heard some pretty scary things about him. They had heard wild tales of spirits and demons, of holes broken through roofs, fights with community leaders, and about a whole host of new friends, none of whom seemed to have a proper job. In fact, they had heard enough. And his family come to collect him. Maybe they'll do a little intervention, get him back under control, put an end to this craziness, this embarrassment. Family. Family is a foundational concept in the Bible. The Bible begins in Genesis, not with talks of nations and tribes. That comes later. It begins with families, big families, real families, dysfunctional families. Dysfunctional families with stories that will make your eyes pop. It often makes me smile when people talk about traditional or biblical family values. Because when you read the Bible, there are stories after stories of rape and murder and incest and all sorts of other things, enough to make your hair curl. And sure, there are other great metaphors to describe that relationship between God and humankind. It always seems to come back to family. And most of the time, we're God's children. We're God's daughters and sons who bring great joy. Well, great anxiety as well sometimes. And so coming into God's kingdom is really about becoming one big family. And like all families, the kingdom has its fair share of crazy aunts and uncles, not forgetting, of course, the black sheep which every family has. So here in Mark chapter 3, Jesus' family hear that Jesus is drawing crowds again, and they go and restrain him because people are talking And what does Jesus do in response? Well, Jesus redefines what family is, who his family is, who his family is. Those who do the will of God. It's very simple. His family are those who do the will of God. And when you do the will of God, you get the chance to be his brother, his sister, and even his mother. And perhaps, just perhaps, we are being told that you have to be a little bit crazy 
to be part of this amazing family, to be part of God's kingdom family. And after all, isn't that how the world sees us sometimes? That we are a little bit odd, that we are a little bit strange for believing in this Jesus bloke, for believing in this kingdom stuff, for believing that things can be different, that we can make a difference in the power of the Spirit. But if we decide to count ourselves part of this crazy family of Jesus, we'll certainly be in good company. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was part of this crazy family. And King confronted the evil of racism with a clear demand for justice that came directly from the mouth of Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. And his craziness got him killed. And Mother Teresa gave up comfort and security to enter the slums of Calcutta to rescue and enrich the lives of the poorest of the poor in India. And her determination, as part of this crazy family we're called to be part of, continues to challenge us to do the same, to believe that things can be different. And we are part of the crazy family of Jesus when we regularly confess our faith that the God who created heaven and earth knows and loves us, has called us in our baptism to be his beloved children and sends us out into the world to witness to his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And this may all be crazy, but this is who we are, who we are called to be. So let us dare to be a little crazy, like Jesus. Let us continue to be maladjusted, whenever we confront discrimination and prejudice, to speak truth to power, even when the world tells us it's hopeless. Let us dare to be the fool and say that we will not make peace with economic injustice that takes the necessities of life from the many to give luxuries to the few. Let us be crazy and challenge the rich and the injustices of this world, even when the world tells us it's pointless and we're crazy. Let us believe that God can call us, despite our imposter syndrome, and use us to declare that the kingdom of God is here. That Beelzebub does not have the last word. To continue to speak out. Even when the world is not listening. Even when the world says we're crazy. In short, our call is to be crazy for Christ. That in time the world may see the truth, that the world may see the method in our madness, or should I say, the Methodist in our madness. May we be crazy for God's kingdom and believe that the impossible is possible in the power of his spirit. Amen. The challenge of our next hymn is not that we build a house, but that we can become a family where all are welcome. Brenda is now going to lead our singing, Let Us Build a House Where Love Can Dwell.
of our circuit life in Southport are our local ecumenical partnerships where we work as single church congregations with our Church of England and United Reformed Church partners. Rachel Bray is the local uh, missional leader at St Philip and St Paul with Wesley. But on Saturday the 26th of June she will be ordained as deacon in Liverpool Cathedral before being ordained priest next year. If she was being ordained in the Methodist Church, the ordination service would include the words, Do you believe and trust that she is by God's grace worthy to be ordained? And the congregation is encouraged to respond enthusiastically. She is worthy. She is worthy. And I hope that Rachel will hear that declaration from us today, that she is indeed worthy. The congregation then goes on to promise to uphold them in their ministry. And we promise to uphold Rachel in her ministry among us. And so now we pray together. On your holy church through the world, gracious God, pour out your spirit. On Rachel, who you have called to be ordained deacon, gracious God, pour out your spirit. On St. Philip and St. Paul with Wesley, where she is called as curate. Gracious God, pour out your spirit. On her family and friends, and all who have helped and encouraged her. Gracious God, pour out your spirit. Remember, O Lord, what you have wrought in us, and not what we deserve. And as you have called us to your service, make us worthy of our calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We do indeed ask for God's blessing on Rachel as she prepares in the weeks ahead for her ordination. That she is assured of our prayers and of our support. She's now going to share with us a few words of testimony. When I was in school at about seven years old, we were asked to write about what I want to be when I grow up. All the other children eagerly started to put pencil to paper, describing their hopes and dreams for their futures. But me, 
Nothing. I froze. I had no idea at all. I don't remember what I went on to write, prompted by my teacher, but I still remember to this day the angst that that exercise caused me. By the time I left university at 22, I still felt some of that seven-year-old angst. I still didn't know what I wanted to be or do. But at least now, I was clearer about what I didn't want to be. There were three things I just knew I wasn't cut out for. Firstly, being a teacher, that looked too hard. Secondly, being a nurse, I was a wuss around all things medical. And thirdly, being a vicar. Growing up as a vicar's daughter in Toxteth in Liverpool, I knew only too well how demanding the role was and how costly it could be. So that was definitely off the cards. That angst raised its head again from time to time over the next 10 years. And maybe it's a good thing I hadn't had my heart set on a career. Since our three boys arrived, questions around careers, jobs and roles had to be put on hold for a very long pause as I was thrust into the role of carer due to the additional needs two of the boys have and one of them also having cystic fibrosis and diabetes. Those early years were seriously tough and challenging and at times I remember losing all sense of my own identity. But over time, as they were growing up, they're now young men in their mid-twenties, I had the opportunity to become more and more involved in the life of the church here at PPW, finding fulfilment at times that I thought might never again be possible as so many dreams had been shattered. I started to find myself surprised by joy. So fast forward a number of years to now. What of those three things I was sure I wasn't cut out for? A teacher? Unexpectedly, I found myself on occasion standing up in front of groups and classes of children and discovering it can actually be fun. A nurse? I've had to become a bit less of a wuss, having spent quite a lot of time around hospitals and helping our son Chris managing his CF and diabetes. And the vicar? Hmm, well, I've been asked so many times in the last three years why I want to be a vicar. It's been an uncomfortable question for someone who has aspired not to be a vicar for such a long time. So why am I doing it? Because despite all my protestations and excuses and doubts, and trust me, there have been many of those. Me? You're joking. I'm too old to start training. My family is complicated. I can't stand up in front of a congregation and preach. I can't be like her or him. I'm not worthy. Despite all that and more, I and the wider church believe that amazingly God has called me to be ordained. Do I feel like an imposter as I approach ordination? At times, definitely. I've already felt that many times and I'm sure there will be many more occasions of that in the future. Is it scary? Absolutely. Is it exciting too? Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be doing my curacy here at PPW, a place and a community I love and people amongst whom I found healing and hope over the last 20 plus eventful years. And so maybe finally, 50 years after freezing at the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I can finally, finally say, I know now and the angst can be put down. Throughout the last five years, God has continued to speak to me about his call on my life through Psalm 116. And so I close with some verses from that psalm that maybe sum up my call as I prepare to be ordained. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? 
I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Let us pray together. Lord of the world, our saviour and friend, as we quieten our minds and listen for your voice, we come before you to pray for all your children. We pray for families divided by war, poverty, hunger or natural disaster. For those places where peace is hard to find. For the ceasefire in Israel-Palestine to hold and lead to peace for that land. We remember all the families in India and pray that help will come from around the world and more of their population will be vaccinated. We pray for families divided by acrimony and misunderstanding. May they find a way to balance their lives together and live in harmony. We pray for families divided by economic circumstances. As our economy opens up, people come off furlough and the hotels that house the homeless reopen to the public. We pray that councils and governments will help those most in need. We pray for agencies that support family life. We think of the Trussell Trust and the food banks here in Southport for the work of Compassion Acts to help families move forward positively with their lives. We pray for Christian people trying to do the will of God in many ways. For medical staff, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, shop assistants, drivers, all carrying on doing their jobs and helping us to bring our lives back to some normality. We give thanks for our own families, for parents who raised and taught us, for children who delight and challenge us, for those who depend on us, we give thanks for Jesus our Saviour and we pray in his name the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. There is not a sign that says you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. There is a craziness about God's kingdom when the impossible becomes possible. Remember how Sarah was told that she was going to have a baby, despite being 90, according to the biblical tradition. And maybe you do have to be a little crazy to believe that things can be different, that God's kingdom can and will come. So let us pray. Sometimes you make us laugh, God. Of course, I pretend not to. Like Sarah, I won't admit it. But really, an old woman will give birth to a nation. John, the wild man of the desert, will get people ready for the new kingdom. Narrow-minded Saul will change the world. Come off it. And yet, by your power, these things did happen. Still, you make me laugh. I have been called to serve you. Perhaps I can stifle a chuckle and think it may be true. Help me to hear your call. Your spirit will transform the people I sit with in church. Yes, help me to believe it really is possible and help me to change too. Peace will come to the earth one day. It's too sad to laugh about. Too impossible, too great a hope. 
Help me still to believe in what you can do. God, make me laugh sometimes. Open me to hear your crazy ideas. Help me to see that the impossible can come true when it is for your kingdom. Amen. Tony Young now leads us in our next hymn that among the madness and lies, Jesus might come in power. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us today. Um... 
thank you to everyone who's taken part in our service today. And we ask God's blessing upon us. We belong here with God's family, but we also belong in his world. Thank you, Lord, that you send us out to turn our beliefs into actions, the impossible into the possible. For you are with us, behind us and in front. And we go now in your name and in your love. And may God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit remain with us always. The glory of mystery until we see him face to face.